Now, it's hard to imagine Trump paying someone $130,000 to not talk about him, but here we are. Back in 2016, Trump might have paid hush money, and even worse for the purposes of this episode, improperly expense it on the Trump Organization books. Should have asked Nixon whether it's a good idea to start messing around with election laws. So as you can imagine, this is a really weird time right now. Now before we get into any real analysis, let me start with a basic fact that nobody's really saying. We all don't really know what's going on right now. Specific charges, evidence, this stuff is currently so secret it's probably being stored in Mar-a-Lago's 13th hole. Anyone who speaks authoritatively about the information we currently know, well, they need a big ol' asterisk next to their reporting. It's just all still secret. So basically this is all educated guesses and in some cases uneducated guesses. So with all that out the way, let me get to what we probably think the crime probably is. Incorrectly reporting a hush money payment on corporate financial documents. Now this is no exception to the classic presidential investigation saying of, it's the cover up not the crime. So let's get into this because it's a bit of a wild ride. Now this case is not taking place in the federal courts, but rather New York state courts, and it's a New York state law that's in question. You see, in New York there's a law that says it's a misdemeanor to intentionally misreport expenses on corporate filings. Now the Trump organization has allegedly misreported a payment to lawyer Michael Cohen. You see, they said that in their financial statements they're paying him a retainer fee, when in fact they were, allegedly, reimbursing him for a hush money payment. <gasps> Scandal of the century. Now most of you might be hearing all this and saying, wait, 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 New York is going after Trump on a misdemeanor crime? I mean, sure, whatever, but grand jury's a bit overkill, right? Well, excuse the pun, but here's where we gotta start trumping up these charges a little bit. You see, if you're misreporting a transaction for the purposes of covering up a crime, well that act of misdemeanor reporting gets escalated from misdemeanor to a low level felony. Now this is where things get a bit more dicey, because now we're bumping up against another super important question. Is what Trump did back in 2016 in violation of federal law? Short answer, don't know. No charges were ever brought. Now, taking a step back, if you're New York State's prosecutor, at this point you need to win two pretty significant arguments for any real charges to be sticking. First, you gotta prove Trump, the head honcho himself, intentionally misreported Trump organization transactions. And then second, on top of that, you also have to prove that the activities that misreporting were covering up were in fact crimes. So that's it, right? Well no, there's one other pretty significant hurdle that the prosecutors of maybe misdemeanors, maybe crimes, maybe nothing are going to have to push back against. Statutes of limitations. Now if you're scratching your head and saying, Whoa, 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 all this stuff happened, what, seven years ago at this point? Can we move on to some more recent crimes? Well, you'd be sounding a lot like both Trump's lawyers and New York State's on the book laws. You see, in this state, that's right, I'm from New York, misdemeanor crimes have a statute of limitations of two years, and felonies have a statute of limitations of five years, and uh, seven years have passed. So how is New York State going to get around this pretty significant legal hurdle? Well, a New York State Supreme Court case from the late 90s says, if the person being accused of a crime is a non-resident, you can deduct the time they spend outside of the state from the statute of limitations countdown clock. Now in 2019, Trump switched his residency from New York to Florida. So it's likely that prosecutors are going to argue that in 2019 the residency changed paused the statute of limitations clock. After 2019, we're only going to be adding days where Trump was present in New York to the statute of limitations countdown clock. 
Now, by this logic, if it's found to be a misdemeanor crime, it's still firmly outside of the statute of limitations. But if it's found to be a felony, it is arguably still within some sort of statute of limitations. Now let me circle back again, because I realize I've thrown a lot at you. First, we got the misdemeanor crime of knowingly misreporting financials. Now this could be something innocent, like expensing your vacation to corporate accounts, still a misdemeanor, but you know, just a misdemeanor. But in this case, it's paying money to Michael Cohen for some reason, while telling everyone you were paying him a legal retainer. Now, if Trump's been found of only committing this crime, it's firmly outside of the statute of limitations. But then you trump it up a little bit by showing that this misreporting was actually covering up a larger crime, which bumps it up into felony charge territory, and arguably, depending on how good your lawyer is, might still fall within a statute of limitations period. If this ends up being the charges that New York state prosecutors are running with, it's really contingent on proving that election laws were broken in 2016. So what would that debate look like? Well, let me just pick up from where the Biden Federal Election Committee left off when they ended their investigation into Trump's hush money payments in 2021 without recommending any charges. Not a great sign. Putting all nuance aside, the prosecution is going to have to prove that the $130,000 payment made to Stephanie Clifford 13 days before the election in exchange for not making the allegation that specifically Trump had had sex with her while his wife was pregnant with his son was made to impact the outcome of the election. Now, that might sound like a slam dunk case, I mean it was 13 days before the election when the payment was made, and that woman could have made a candidate Trump look like a real dirtbag. But looking at it from a slightly different angle, Trump's legal team could argue that, hey, this hush money payment had nothing to do with the election. The guy has a wife, kids, and a reputation to uphold would have made the exact same payment in 2005 to keep all this from coming out. Now, I know that's not the greatest argument in the world, but you don't need the greatest argument in the world just to cast a reasonable doubt on the situation. So how would you prove and argue against that, that this was specifically an election expense? Well, you'd need witness testimony. I mean, they do have Michael Cohen going on the record saying that this payment was made with the specific intent of impacting election outcomes, but at this point, he's about as reliable a witness as a misprinted fortune cookie. Now, this is where us as reporters or people who talk politics, not knowing what evidence prosecutors have, puts us at a huge disadvantage when it comes to this topic. There could be something major out there. I mean, some people are saying prosecutors might have flipped Trump Organization Chief Financial Officer Alan Weisselberg, which would be huge. But again, my sources for that are some people. Also, remember, until we get some actual charging documents in our hands, we don't even know for sure what the charges are gonna look like. So there you have it. A president indicted and a lot of unanswered questions out there. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, click on the link in the description to join this growing list of exceptional individuals. Also remember to like, subscribe, ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.